had to look at my reading plan for through in the Word, and uh, today, Wednesday, we have two books we're going to look at, Zephaniah and Haggai. Um, <clears throat> again, minor prophets, uh, that means they're short books. Zephaniah is only three chapters, <coughs> excuse me, and Haggai is just two, um, separated by a long time, incidentally, just because they're next to each other in the book, in the Bible doesn't mean that they were next to each other in history. So when we look at the book of Zephaniah, we find out uh, right at the beginning that this was during the reign of Josiah. And you recall uh, from our previous reading in Kings and Chronicles that Josiah was a very righteous king, uh, became king, I think he was eight years old and started some uh, tremendous uh, spiritual and political reforms within Judah. Um, during his reign from 640 to 609. Um, it's, if you have to refresh yourself, here's, I looked up the uh, chapters in Kings at 2 Kings 2, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 22 verses 1 through 23 verse 30, and also in Chronicles 34, 1 to 35, 27. So Josiah was really a, a um, kind of a, um, uh, island of righteousness uh, surrounded by a sea of apostasy against Yahweh. He's talking about something here that we've seen already, this day of the Lord. Uh, not uh, the, It's a period of time. It's called the day of the Lord, but it's not a uh, particular day or a single day. And uh, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment, a day, a day uh, where God brings uh, both judgment and restoration. We've seen this in Joel. Uh, Joel is about the day of the Lord. Zephaniah is about the day of the Lord. And when we come into the New Testament, we see 2 Thessalonians is a book about the day of the Lord. And then in detail, uh, the day of the Lord is described in Revelations, cha- Revelation 6 through 22. And again, the day of the Lord is both a day of darkness. As all days start, they start in the dark but also a day of light. It's a day of restoration. That's what we see here in Zephaniah. He begins with a judgment against Judah, but then in his prophetic vision, he sees a God's ultimate day of the Lord coming, and that's what we see here. So let's look at this. Uh, chapter 1, I call this judgment on Judah. Chapter 2, an urge to repent. In chapter 3, just simply Jerusalem. So we see the promise of coming judgment on Judah. So this is uh, well in advance of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion, which we looked at yesterday uh, in the book of Habakkuk um, in 605. Uh, This is well in advance of that. And he uh, is uh, warning Judah of total and complete judgment. That's what we see in verses 3 through 7 of chapter 1, total and complete uh, judgment. Um, Let's say, just like say verse 3 there, because then starting in verse 4, he calls out specific groups of people, uh, pointing his finger at specific groups of people that are going to uh, be included in this judgment. It's not an exhaustive list, but it starts out, as you can imagine, with idolaters. Um, and uh, it's important to look at this. So uh, in verse 4, he says he's going to stretch out his hand against Judah. He's going to cut off from this place the remnant of Baal, so those Baal worshipers, and the name of the idolatrous priests. Well, this is interesting. The priests themselves have become part of this idol worship of Baal. And look at the end of verse 5. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord... And yet, swear by another god, a god named Milcrom. So what he's doing here, he is pointing out, not that they have turned totally away from him. They haven't uh, turned their backs on him totally. What they've done is they've taken the local gods, they've taken other gods, and incorporated that into worship with him. So they're serving Yahweh, they're serving Baal, they're serving Milcom. It's not as if they've forgotten Yahweh, but they're not serving him exclusively. And that, brothers and sisters, is idolatry. To worship something else, to depend on something else, or in the words of Habakkuk, 
to not live by faith in God, but to live by faith in something else is idolatry. Even if we mix it with faith in God, you know, this is a particular message for us as we approach a coming election. It'll be coming up here before we know it. We want to put our faith in political parties. We want to put our faith in certain people. Uh, but uh, that is not where our faith belongs as Christians. Our faith belongs in God, in the promises of God, and what God assures. Uh, I'll be preaching a message on this. I mentioned before, at, if you're in the Estes Park area at First Baptist Church of Estes Park on October 11th called uh, The Sovereignty of God in the United States, uh, in which I'll be discussing uh, how God uh, works in the United States and how us as Christians should respond to that. But here he's bringing judgment on idolaters, uh, verse 8 and 9, uh, on princes. He says, I will punish the officials, uh, the king's sons. Um, kind of an odd statement here. Everyone who leaps across the threshold. These are uh, idolatrous leaders leading their people into this ritual of serving other gods. But it's been uh, not only the individual idolaters in Israel, but their leaders have led them into idolatry. Their leaders have led them into depending on something other than God. The merchants, why would he call out the merchants? Well, uh, in verses 10 and 11, uh, because a part, part of the law was that God's people were to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And that meant no buying and selling. The gates of the city were to be closed and the merchants were to be um, putting that day aside for rest, and they refused to do that, so the merchants come under God's judgment. Look at verses 12 through 13. He brings judgment on the complacent, on the indifferent. Look in, at the end of verse 12, I, I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good. That is, those people who look at what's going on in Israel and say, throw up their hands, that we can't do anything, that this is beyond us. God's not going to act, so neither should we. And God is going to bring judgment on those people. Uh, that happens in Israel. And that happens in churches. When churches go astray, their leaders lead them in the wrong direction. Their leaders lead them away from the Lord. Uh, if the people don't stand up and resist that, God will bring judgment on those people. He'll bring judgment on that church. Um, review, for example, Revelation chapters uh, 2 and 3 and see the judgment God brings against not only the leaders of those apostate churches, five of the seven, but on the people as well. So he's going to judge them for their indifference, for their do-nothing attitude. And then um, the uh, starting in verse 14 through the end of the chapter, we see the terror of God's judgment, uh, that this is going to be a terrible judgment that he brings against Judah and all these groups of people. Look at the end of verse 14, the mighty man cries. Uh, verse 17, I will bring distress on mankind. So his vision is opening up here. His vision is looking beyond the immediate judgment, which is an example for us all, according to Romans 15, an example that we're to heed. He's opening up to God's ultimate day of the Lord, the ultimate judgment that's coming. God urges them to repent in chapter 2, verses 1 through um, verses one and 2. He urges them to gather together, to come together. You know, it should be their leaders bringing them together for repentance. But he's calling the people to do that. And in verse 3, he calls on them to repent. It's no, there's always time with the Lord. It's always time to turn back to him, always time to bring ourselves in alignment with his promises and what he wants us to do. Then beginning in verse four through the end of the chapter, he's going to bring judgment not only on Judah, but on the nations around Judah themselves. And this judgment on these other nations will come first as an example, as a proof of what God is going to do. A proof to us as well that God's judgments are sure. As the writer of Hebrews said, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, even for believers to do that. Uh, as I've said before, Rome, uh, Hebrews 12 tells us that his, his punishment comes upon us in stages 
or phases or degrees that go from a simple rebuke to scourging. And it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a God who's going to scourge. So we see in verse 2, Uh, this urge to repent, and then the judgment on the nations. So in light of what he's going to do, they need to repent. Finally, in chapter 3, his attention turns to Jerusalem, his holy city. Chapters 1 through 5 are um, a warning to Jerusalem, a final warning that he gives them. And then in verses 6 through 8, he laments uh, their refusal to heed his warning, his refusal, their refusal to heed his warning. So in verse eight, he's somewhat sarcastic here. He says, okay, then wait for me, declares the Lord for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. Wait for me then. If you're not going to turn, if you're not going to, if you're going to refuse to repent, then just wait. My decision is to gather nations and assemble kingdoms Uh, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Again, he's looking way beyond what's going to happen to Judah. That's just an example of a, a, a ultimate day of the Lord that's coming. And as we see in the prophets, uh, God is going to chastise his people. He's going to hone them. He's going to refine them in this fire of judgment. But ultimately, his intent is to restore them. God is going to bring glory to himself by both punishing and restoring his people. And the last part of the chapter uh, 3 is about that restoration. Verses 9 down to 13 is this renewal. We've seen this before in in Joel, that he's going to renew them, that that new covenant is is going to be uh, honored by him, and he is going to renew them. Then there will be uh, rejoicing in Jerusalem, uh, incredible rejoicing. The people will rejoice, but look uh, startlingly in verse 17. The Lord your God will be in in your midst. This has been Israel's hope, anticipation, dream from Genesis 3, that the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one will, who will save. He's a warrior God that comes among them. Look at these three words here. <clears throat> he will rejoice. The word is yasis here in Hebrew. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. Yagil, he will exalt. He will yagil over you. First, he will yasis over you, rejoice. Here he will regil over you, exalt. And finally, with loud singing. The word there is rena. This is loud, exuberant singing. God is going to be singing over us. Isn't that an incredible thought? Isn't that something to look forward to? Will we be rejoicing and praising and honoring him in his presence? And he will be singing over us, his saved people, his redeemed people. And we see this uh, restoration finishing then here. Turn to the book of Haggai. Just have a few minutes here. Book of Haggai is uh, um, the first of the prophets that come after the exile. So the one we just looked at, uh, Zephaniah, is before the uh, first invasion of uh, an exile of Judah. Uh, Haggai is after the exile. When if you go back to Ezra and Nehemiah. Haggai is mentioned there because he was prophesying uh, while they were rebuilding the temple. They're back in the land. These prophecies um, happened, as best we can tell, between August and December of 520 B.C. And what he is doing here is, uh, if you recall the story in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, when Zerubbabel came back, they were slow to rebuild the temple. They were intimidated. They were afraid. Haggai comes to encourage them. How gracious is God? He sends this prophet to encourage them. So chapter one is a call uh, to construct the temple in chapter one. And then um, chapter two, 
the verses 1 through 9 is a call to have courage in the Lord. Uh, 10 through 19 is a call to be um, holy before the Lord. And finally, 20 to 23 is to have confidence in the future. And these future promises of God, promises that are yet to be main, uh, yet to be kept, but will be kept because we know God is a promise-keeping God. So enjoy your reading today, brothers and sisters. Just by way of way of application here, we see over and over in these later prophets, we're going to see it really clearly in Zechariah. They're looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. They're looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Uh, we are with them looking forward to that. As we'll see in when we go through the book of Matthew, his coming is delayed, but not denied that Jesus is going to return. And that's where we need to put our hope and our confidence, not in what's happening around us, not in the world, not in our ability to manage, but in our confidence in the coming of the Lord. So put your confidence there, brothers and sisters. God bless you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.